Well, thank you both um, for presentations that I found challenging to get my head around, um, which is always exciting. One of the first questions that, that came to mind, and I'll start with you, Doc, is that in effect you're both talking about very disruptive activities, activities that disrupt some very long and dearly held business models. Um, and somebody has to pay for stuff, you know, somebody has to pay for the functionality that we're all talking about. And clearly, in your case, Doc, with the big data, the amount that's being invested in that, how do you see that swinging? Obviously, following what you said about the computing and the networking having been wrested back from that kind of control, how do you see that happening with data? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, I, I think of it not so much as disruption as just construction. Okay, that's, we're going to build something new, and if that's destructive or disruptive to some, uh, so what? Um, they're really, the, the, it's just, there's so much more we can do than we're doing now. Also, an enormous amount of money is being wasted right now, especially in marketing. Just, it's a colossal amount that even, even if with advertising you're only paying for click-throughs, the, the amount of noise that's generated trying to guess at what we might want all the time is just, is just stupefying and it's not very efficient. So, so you know, the, the main proposition that I've made to the marketplace and a lot of companies are making now is that we can have much better economic signaling going from ourselves to the marketplace than we're getting right now with the with the with sellers guessing at what we might want yeah. so but but you and i can see it as constructive i would imagine a lot of the companies some of the crm companies that you mentioned yeah will perceive it as sure and, and, and you and i both deal with this all the time i mean you know we're, we get brought in um you know to to, to tell the truth and and to, to you know tell the big companies what they want to hear but aren't going to do and in many cases they're not in a position to do it that's why what I've been trying to do is, is, is stimulate development from, out, from the outside that can be gradually adopted. That's why I'm so enthused about the, the, the possibilities with QR codes. That are, there's just a, it's just a, a standard that's laying around that's useful. Um, something I should have made clear there, by the way, I think, is that, is that we don't have to wait for a manufacturer to put a, a QR code on anything. We can put it on anything ourselves, and we can create we can create on our own, and that value is going to become obvious to companies. I mean, right now they can save money by, you know, the, the intelligence that they're going to get from people publishing stuff they know about their own things, for example, or sharing it. We, when we all have our own APIs, they can subscribe to our APIs, and and. and that's know. that's a good transition to Jan yeah. Yeah, then, because that, that was the question I was going to ask you. That in a sense, um, and we talked about this briefly beforehand the academic world is to me depressingly focused on funding and budgets and, and the correlation between that and the publishing mechanisms and it's a very locked up world at the moment isn't it so they must be watching what you're doing with a degree of concern or interest yeah indeed they do um, I think what we were always very aware of that is that you can't just force anybody in academic research into the public, right? You can't say, okay, we, you need to make public what you're actually doing right now because there's a lot of pressure for a lot of money. Uh, a lot of researchers are being afraid of being scooped. So you need to build in very granular privacy controls. Uh, but I think conceptually what you can do is you can just anonymize data and then uh, aggregate it. And that's what, what actually we did. Um, eventually what it counts is do you have an impact on a user? D does the user really value what you do? Um, and I think that's, that's what we've always focused on and that's why we had seen so much uptake. And your users are individual academics then, presumably? Excuse me? Are you, who are your users in that sense? Are they the, the, the academics creating the content or the...? Yeah, so the users are really like guys like me, researchers, PhD students, professors. But funnily enough, we can also see now, actually, we reveal actually who is the academic community or who should we consider to be the academic community because we have so many users that are in, in, the gov in government. Uh, we have a lot of what I call amateur experts. So people, like I've learned, there's a huge community in the US, apparently, uh, bird watchers. Uh, so they, 
they have daytime jobs, but on their weekend they go somewhere else in, into the nature and they uh, look at, you know, they, they track birds and write reports and they are really interested in academic stuff around that because they are really engaged with that. But that doesn't mean that they are like full-time scientists. Now with Mendeley we can actually see how do, they, do those people consume that content, interact with that content and actually show what is the real impact of, you know, what a research paper uh, means and so forth. Because another question that occurred to me while you were speaking was that one of the other main functions of academia or, or of universities is accreditation and, and the verification validity of, of, of expertise, if you like. And a, a bit of like Dave, White, Dave um, Snowden yesterday when I asked him about who determines the algorithms and the patterns. I and mean, when you were talking about this uh, recommendation engine, if you like, within Mendeley, somebody, you, is determining the algorithms that will make one document more successful than another. And, and, and we see this in Amazon where people can game recommendations for books or whatever else. How do you guard against that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I would say once we get to that stage that people try to game Mendeley, I think that's, that's so to say, in a positive way, it's a, posi it's a very great achievement. Um, on the other hand, we're very aware of that. So we have a team of data science scientists who actually very much look into that. But the other thing is also about, uh, I don't think that science is a popularity contest. So let's say if you wanted to recommend one paper so that that readership goes up, for example, right? Um, I don't think that this is actually what people necessarily want because you want to do research into an area and want to find what is the last, the, the least read item or paper in, in a specific field that was published last year. Because you actually want to see why haven't so many people picked it up. So, I think there are different other dynamics at work potentially that we have to look into um, and as regards to gaming I would say so far we haven't seen any attempts. I think as a system, as it's crowdsourced, I, I think it requires significant effort to actually game it um, but so far we haven't seen anything like that. And it also touches a, a little bit on the previous presentation on quantified self and, and to come back to you Doc, I guess and, and the points you were making about us resting control back, if you like, of our own capabilities from, from big corporations. That balance between the individual and their ability to do things as against the support and the infrastructure. And in fact, the question that came up about the government and should the government be managing the data, we need new structures to make the best use of the sort of stuff that you're proposing. What sort of patterns do you see those building into? Well, there are a couple of structures worth mentioning. Um, one I mentioned already, which is that uh, already there's a, an operating system, on, which is a platform called CloudOS that Kinetics came up with, that, um, that things in your personal cloud can um, sit on and you can write programs on. And so that's, that's, one, that's one form of structure, you might say. Um, the other is there's, there's a, another personal cloud development um, uh, around what are called trust networks, where, um, where we as, as groups of people create the trust frameworks that um, a large company can rely on and you know, uh, to, to know that somebody's real, for example, and not just a machine. That's, that's a, a fairly complicated area, but it's one where, again, you see development happening by small companies on the edge and on the outside that are, I can, I can think of four companies that are working with trust frameworks and networks um, in, in the UK and the Netherlands and in the US that are really interesting, somewhat different approaches in each case to a, lot, a large degree compatible as well. But we're going to have, we're gonna be able to assert trust um, in ways that don't rely on having to have the government in the middle of it or having to have some big company in the middle of it. I mean, right, right now we're doing identity, for example, and um, it's very common for, for people to log in with Facebook, right? We don't know what happens when we do that, right? We really don't in most cases. Um, uh, if a company is a bad actor, if we don't have our privacy set up in the way we want to, and it's not easy to set it up in a fully secure way, Anything could be happening with that data. It's not very safe. It's, it's just a stopgap measure we have now. But it's a big company measure. You know, we should trust Facebook. Um, what's the structure in that? There's no structure there. It's crazy, actually. 
but it's all we've got if we want to simplify things. Um, we don't need big companies in the middle of things all the time. You know, we, we, in an open marketplace, in a natural open marketplace, like you find in a bazaar um, or, you know, a farmer's market or something like that, we work it out. You know, we work out this, the sociology of that in a pretty simple way. I'm probably moving away from where your question was, but I think we're always sort of looking when we have technology for big structure in the middle of it and big administration of some sort, and I think we don't need it all the time. It was more just wondering, and I guess this question relates to both of you as well, that this is a sense, in a sense, recognizing the value of what we choose to share and, and rewarding us, in a sense, for our willingness to share that. So, so how do you imagine, you know, money tends to follow value and, and do we get paid for being more open than being more closed or? I, I have a short answer for that, which is that <clears throat> most of our personal data has use value and not sale value. There's, there's an argument in the world right now that says because Facebook and Google and Twitter and these other companies are making money off of our personal data, we should get paid for that. The amount that's actually being made on us on a transactional basis is tiny, 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 tiny. It's really not worth it. But, our, but it has use value to us. And we tend to always look at, like I've been around Linux for a long time, right? Linux has infinite use value. It has very little sale value. Um, the internet has infinite use value. It has, almost, it has no sale value whatsoever. Dan? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, uh, there's obviously a saying, uh, if, if, you don't ha if you don't have to pay for a product, you are the product. Um, and, I, uh, you know, we are transparent about that. In Mendeley, you are not required to share anything publicly. Um, but if you do, you get a benefit from that, right? For example, if you uh, add more documents to your library, you get better recommendations. So that is of value to you. Um, we could choose to, let's say, charge a user um, to get that service. But we say, okay, like, we can do so much more by actually uh, doing that for free, so to say, and offering you the ability to provide input into the database and we give something back to you. Um, we don't lock anybody in. We adhere to open standards so that local data is stored as an SQLite database. You can extract your own data via the API and choose to go to a different tool. Uh, and eventually we will, we will have to win by providing the best product in the market. And so that's, that's how we approach this. I guess it almost goes back to, to my old days in knowledge management where people would talk about rewarding people for their willingness to share knowledge and it always seemed such a blunt and inappropriate approach that people want to share for all sorts of complicated reasons. But, but what I would say is, and I think my feeling is, a spe I mean, maybe that's specific to academic research, but I, don't, I think if we don't make a, a little bit of a forced effort to get people to collaborate more and understand the value of more openness, that, that industry will forever be locked up and inaccessible for the broader audience. And I think we need just to make an effort to get people to understand that there is some value in sharing stuff. Um, and so I think that's what we're trying to demonstrate with Mendeley. Maybe there's a limit to that. We'll have to find that out and we will listening, we'll be listening to the community when people don't want something. We do that as well. Uh, we've changed things based on that in the past as well. Um, but I, I, I do believe in that there is a positive outcome if we help people to share more in the space of academic research. And, and last question before I ask for, for some questions from the audience. But Doc, I guess we're talking about change and helping people to change or giving them reasons to change. Conceptually, personal cloud is quite a hard thing to get your head around, as I just found. How do we help sell it? How do we make it more likely to happen than not? We're going to, wow. hello. Um, uh, we're, we're going to need what I call inventions that mother necessity, right? Where, um, I mean, smartphones were around for a long time before they got useful. And it really took the iPhone to make that happen. Um, you know, PCs were around for a long time before they got useful. Um, we, you know, we, we, need, we need the box office tools. I, I would not, I, I've actually gone out of my way since 2006 when we started Project VRM to not publicize it. I wanted to get the code in the world. Um, one of the reasons I'm talking about it now is because there is some 
momentum with a small number of developers that are that have jumped onto this thing. Uh, one guy in particular, his name is T. Rob, T. Dot Rob, quit his job at IBM to go work on this stuff because it's too interesting not to. So, um, Mark Andreessen, who's the he's now an investor, but he's you know the primary uh, creator of the graphical browser with Mosaic and then later with Netscape. Um, when I inter interviewed him back in 1998, he just sort of dropped this line that was really good. He said, all technology trends start with technologists. We need the techies to adopt this stuff first. And they're going to sort of scaffold up the way this thing is going to look when the rest of us start using it. Um, we're just at the beginning point for that. It's like, here, here are some pieces that we can, we can strap together and start doing some interesting stuff with. So, what I would say at this point is I wouldn't try and sell it. I just like watch this space and see what happens. Thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? Joyce. <laughs> Somebody I know well. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just wanted to add something about the um, what your que your last question, Ewan. Um, the uh, that just today we got um, a notice from uh, BBC News on that Mercedes is putting QR tags into two places on the vehicle and what will be loaded onto it is a schematic of the vehicle so that if this car is in an accident where the there's a people uh, caught in there but they don't know where to cut because the car you can't even see what it what it is anymore but the emergency responders come and they don't know well if I cut through this is it going to be a gas line and we'll have an explosion so they've just decided that they're going to put QR tags so that anybody with a smartphone can see what the schematic is for the vehicle so if you're asking there will be little things like that because now the the person who owns the car is in a position to talk to the company because if they use that QR code, they can tell the company stuff about the car. So with a, with, with a QR code, which is, as Doc said, you know, open and easily available, a lot of people can envision how you can talk, like the product becomes the way that you can talk to the company. You have a place to stand as long as you have a cloud around that product. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or other comments? Thomas? Tough question. Um, Doug, what do you think is the VisiCalc, the PageMaker, the Word Excel, the WordPress of the personal cloud? What is it that's going to create so much value for us that we're actually going to shift to it? Not necessarily because of the value set and the control, but because there's a whole new dimension of the product that changes everything. Well, it, I think it's going to be something written on Cloud OS or an OS like that. Um, it's, I, I, my own personal fantasy are one of two things. One is a really good intent casting app, right? A, a really good intent casting thing where, so I mean, for example, intent what's that? Could you explain intent casting? Intent casting is where, where I can issue, um, I can do the advertising. I can advertise what I want. Yesterday I tried doing it with Twitter. Here, some people tried to come through for me. I had money ready to spend on a lens, um, to, to rent a lens for my camera sitting there on the front table because the lens crapped out on that one. And that's money that we call MLOT, money left on the table, because nobody came through when I, when I, when I tweeted that. If I could have done that in a way that advertised that to the open marketplace and people could pick it up, they, this, is, this is doable stuff right now. I mean, somebody needs to design this, but it has to be really easy. And, and, and at the back end, it has to be tied in with, well, this isn't just any camera, it's the one that took all these pictures. I mean, I can add all kinds of value behind that. Um, so that's one thing, intent casting is one. Um, the other is, is whatever app will finally pull together all this quantified self stuff. Um, there, and I see that tied in with healthcare as well. There's, there's a, 
Um, and it's more likely to happen in Europe or some other place that doesn't have the insanity of the U.S. healthcare system, which is almost terribly, so terribly broken, it's pretty hard to fix. But, um, but those are, you know, something that pulls together all the quantified self stuff, to me, is that or intent casting might be the, the top ones. Thank you. Any more questions? I totally subscribe to the personal cloud and to VRM, but I see a very, very big obstacle, uh, which is the actual internet. Uh, so the the, the actual it, internet, yes, the speed oh, okay. of oh, internet yeah. and the asymmetry of internet. And I, I very much suspect that until we have uh, good speed, uh, symmetric speed, and also, also EPV6 maybe, because uh, uh, my, my personal cloud objects are not connected to the net uh, as servers. They are clients, so they cannot offer services. Mm -hmm. They do not have an address. Yeah, you're, you're putting your finger on two of the biggest problems out there. Uh, the first is asymmetrical provisioning of, of connectivity. Uh, the, the Internet's protocols do not call for an asymmetric, um, an asymmetric net. It's the way that the phone and cable companies designed it, the, the way it's delivered to us in the first place, because they imagined that it was going to absorb television, and it's doing that right now. Television is moving to our handheld devices, and it looks even more asymmetrical than ever because we're busy watching a lot and not uploading a lot. But what's going to happen is that Small companies and others that are going to use the cloud for business purposes are going to require faster upstream speed and are going to be willing to pay for it. And once that starts happening, it's going to be really interesting. The, the, uh, what Google is not being stupid with its gigabit program in the U.S. Um, Kansas City, Austin, Texas, Provo, Utah, the cities that they're setting up with gigabit service to anybody at a pretty cheap price is the new beachfront property, it's the new ports, it's the new transportation hubs. Companies are going to move there um, and new businesses are going to be created that take full advantage of really fast connectivity. So, I mean, right now we all have a really big problem with storage, right? If we, we're all shooting lots of videos or shooting lots of pictures, we want to save those, where are they going? You know, the biggest, I think the biggest, um, time machine or time capsule that Apple sells is like three gigabits it's, or, or three terabytes, not enough. And, and they fail, they all fail. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've got drawers full of dead disk drives and, and I'm not alone. A lot of people have exactly the same problem. And the only way we can address it is by storing it off site. And it, somebody is gonna come up with a business there that requires that to happen. So that's, you know, that's one one big problem. The the other, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember what you said now, but it was. It, but asymmetrical provisioning is. I think we'll solve that. But right now, it doesn't look very good. So. Any more questions? Uh, hello. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I've seen the. Uh, if if we keep the um, growing of data exponential growth. I've seen one research that in 10 years we have to spend all money of the world to keep it, or some kind of this. So it's become very expensive to keep all this data. And uh, do you have any idea about maybe expiration of data, that it will be, dis will disappear in some time, of some, yeah, and how to measure what which data maybe Mendeley have these yeah. kind of ranks that one data is more precious with respect to the other? Um, I would say um, we haven't really thought about deleting or expiration of, of data, I have to say. I think for us it's still too early. Um, and we would also not say that maybe a one piece of data has a higher value than another piece. Again, Mendeley would not be the entity to judge we'd give it to the community and say, okay, use that data as you like, and you determine how you want to extract value from that. Um, 
I mean, I know that I would say storage at the moment is, is from a very practical point of view is not an issue to us. We have huge amounts of data, but you know, we outsource that to, to the cloud, Amazon Web Services. We pay a bill monthly. Um, and yeah, so far, I mean, we haven't thought about expiration of data really. So I would say, I'm not sure, I can't, I can't say more to that than that. It's also got a non-physical consequence to it as well. I was thinking this morning about the, 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 the um, personal data, the, 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 the personal quantified self stuff. And I track, I've got my Fitbit in my pocket. I, I keep track of all sorts of stuff I do on the internet. I keep the documents I've written, the blog posts I've written, the Facebook updates. Uh, I have hundreds, if not thousands of books in my house. And it's eventually becoming a burden that I'm feeling pressure because I've got all this stuff that I feel I need to make some sense of and have some kind of patterns in to make judgments about. And it's actually becoming a pain in the arse. So I've just given away lots of my books because it's just made me feel better to get rid of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> some, some kind of time, of time to live, like a TCP packet, no? Yeah. I think, we need, I think we need to get better at doing that, that's for sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I should point out there's a, a lot of very heavy and difficult discussions going on around what's called digital death. What do we do when we go, yeah. you know, when, when, when we die off? I mean, there's, um, it's a totally unsolved problem. You know, and Joyce and I were talking about that this morning. You know, if something happens to either of us, what does the other one do? Yeah. What is, uh, you know, and it's, it's difficult. There is no single answer for that. And there are a number of people who have tried that have come up with it. There's one guy in the UK who came up with something a few years ago and couldn't get the market going completely. He's probably he's working on something else now that's related to it, so I don't want to say too much about it. But it's a tough one, and I don't... I don't well, we, we just got our wills rewritten, and I put a document in along with the wills with various passwords, because I realized that so much of the information that it takes to live our lives is tied up in places that are password protected, and I'm the only one who knows those passwords. Death is a very cheery note to go into lunch on, isn't it? <laughs> Matt, do you want to, one last question. Cheer us up. <laughs> you use the phrase personal cloud. Do you think we'll end up with a personal cloud or many personal clouds? And if the latter, how will that work? I don't know. Um, I think, I mean, right now we have a term, like, like I said, we, we kind of hijacked this term. You know, companies were using cloud, now we're using cloud. And the we is a few, a few developers right now. And I think one of the, um, well, Phil, Phil Winley came up with the term Pico for like a personally identify intelligent computing object for every single thing there is can have its own little cloud and its own little way of doing things. So I think every little thing can have its data and that data can be called a cloud. Um, but I think each of us individually will have one in the same way. I mean, look at it this way. For example, um, we, what we call sanity is the ability we have to organize our many selves behind one name or one presentation, you know. But, you know, who you are to your mom and who you are to your boss and who you are to the people you play rugby with or whatever, you know, or when you're alone doing something wacky, these are all different people in many ways. And, and but what, you know, what we call sanity is we can organize that stuff in, in the way that we present it to the world and it's, it's subtle but it's complete somehow. We're gonna build that with data as well. And I think it'll be, it'll be insane if it's many different ones that are fully disorganized. That's what we have now, I mean, right? It's insane for us to have all this personal data in all these many different places. It's completely wacky. One of the things I observed in your talk, you, um, 1982, computers going from a central resource to a personal resource, communications going from a central thing to something you hold in your pocket. Just, it was interesting that when you came to data, you were actually almost talking about this, the opposite way, that this stuff doesn't come to me, it goes to some place external to me, but it's somehow associated with me. And I was just thinking if it came to my phone, for example, that that would be the, the, mod, the same model. It, it's a tough one because we are, um, if you study cognitive linguistics, which I've done, um, our, our metaphors are all embodied. We understand things in terms of our bodies. We say good is up and bad is down because we walk upright. We say 
um, dark is bad and good is light because we're diurnal, we're daytime animals. An owl might have a different way of looking at it. Um, we say we, you know, you know, I catch your drift, we, I, you know, I get your idea. It's like, it's, we have opposable thumbs and that's part of the way we understand the world. It's very hard to do that with data. Data is, num is numbers, it's not, and, and it's really early in whatever this is going to be. You know, I, I said yesterday, the, you know, the internet that we know is 18 years old, it's nothing in, 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 in the long run. We're just beginning to scaffold up whatever understandings we're gonna have here. The, the main thing I wanted to get across is that it's only gonna be fully sane when we are in charge of the stuff where we are, ought to be the responsible parties and we ought to be the ones doing what's ours. Whatever we end up calling that, I, you know, maybe something else, don't know. Well, thank you. Thank you.